I'd like to share something with you uh, this morning that, you know, has been a personal practice of mine, uh, especially in times where I'm uh, stretched beyond measure. And uh, if you'll just give me a few minutes to share a particular verse of scripture. When I first gave my life to the Lord, uh, I wanted, I, I, I identified that in some believers, it seemed as though, not just historical believers, not just those written in Bible times, but uh, those that I had experienced in life. I was pastoring at 21 years old. By the time of 23, I was being drained and, and uh, uh, felt as though I was being unsuccessful at the task. I kind of have this view that the first five years of any ministry, God molds you before he gives you any growth. And um, I, I identified that some people have been able to get to a place with the Lord that caused a personal transformation in them, which gave them access to see things that maybe other believers in the outer court did not see. And I sought the Lord for this, and he brought me to a particular portion of Scripture, and I spent probably eight months uh, on this particular area of Scripture, seeking God, asking for him to bring me to a place uh, that I can get a touch from him uh, in the area of personal transformation that would assist me in ministry, in times of depletion, a place that I can run to in a time of need. So if you're looking for that, then I have a message for you this morning. It comes, again, out of my uh, personal relationship with the Lord. I normally don't preach on areas of this. I, I keep these things uh, hidden for myself. They're sustainable for me. It's kind of the grapes that I partake of for myself, um, you have your Bibles, go with me to Exodus chapter 3. We're in the book of Exodus chapter 3. We're dealing with Moses. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. But I want to stop there, just give you some more or less timing and geographical issues that are surrounding this verse of scripture. So Moses raised as the adopted son of Pharaoh in the house of Pharaoh, a prince of Egypt, educated in parliament, uh, having a high stature, is now being called by God in order to be a deliverer to Israel. He has very terrible success at it. He flees Egypt because Pharaoh wants to kill him. He's 40 years now on what we would call to be the backside of the mountain, and he's there. He's now married. Jethro is his father-in-law. He feels, he feels as though God can no longer use him. The call of God stripped from him. Uh, he has had no more communication with God, and we pick up on the storyline here. He's not in a place that I think is unnatural for all of us to get to. I personally believe that God is always looking to get each one of us to an isolated place. He wants to get you away from the crowd, and whether that's into a place of Wilderness, whether it's a place of isolation, he wants to get you to a place where he has your attention. And he'll use whatever means he can. For Joseph, he'll use a prison if he has to. He needs to get your attention. Now, I'd rather be willful in having him get my attention than to resist it. I'd rather get to the place of isolation, not through aggravation and perspiration, but a willingness. A holy God needs to get a holy child to a place of holy ground. And he's going to do whatever he needs to to get to the place where you can experience him and only him. We see this also in the Apostle Paul. In Galatians chapter 2, um, we get this segue of the Apostle Paul speaking about this. So he's knocked off a horse by the presence of Jesus. Jesus appears to him, but immediately he goes into the desert place. And the Bible tells us here that 14 years after that he went to Jerusalem and Barnabas. So 14 years he spent on the backside of the mountain. A lot of us, we want to go from obscurity to success overnight. We have this microwave version of ministry, microwave version of relationship with God, when God is looking to take his time and develop you in a level of maturity. 
You good this morning? Verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off your feet for the place that thou art standing is holy ground. If you're taking notes, write it down. Holy ground. Holy ground. Holy ground is not a destination place. It's not like you're uh, looking for Mecca. It's not like a journey to Disneyland. It's not like taking a flight somewhere. Where are you heading today? I'm heading to holy ground. Hallelujah. Holy ground's not found like that. In many ways, you don't know you're on holy ground till you're there. And when you're there, it doesn't seem holy. It seems miserable. Then you realize that the miserable ground's actually the holy ground because what makes the ground holy is not you. What makes the ground holy is not the circumstance. The ground isn't holy till God shows up. So God could use any type of ground, any type of situation. He could turn a prison cell into a holy ground. He can cause a hospital room to be holy ground. It's not a place you travel. It's a place you become aware of. It's a place that you didn't know was holy. You're just on the backside of a mountain and all of a sudden... The bush is burning and God's presence shows up. And God's presence takes that same desert place, that same place of isolation, that same place of misery, that same place of depletion, and he turns it around and he makes it holy because his presence is there. This is where Moses ends up. It's a spiritual place. It's designed to give you a transformation in your spirit to the condition of your spirit. Three particular keys or three particular um, revelations that come out of this verse of Scripture. If you're writing notes, go ahead and write this down. And again, I preference this with, I think this is a message not towards the outward journey of a lot of Christians. In Christianity, we have a habit of repeating the garden all over again. We have a certain series of fig leaves that we think are going to cover the outward shell of our humanity. I want to talk about the inward man, not the old man, the inward man. It takes a little bit of depth to get there. It takes a little bit of brokenness to experience it. It's not about nip and tuck. It's not about what shoes that you wear. It's not about the jackets that you wear, the car that you uh, drive in. It's really a depth of soul that God wants to get to. This message is about a soul issue. This message is an internal issue about you and your relationship with the Lord. Number one, if you're writing down uh, this one, the first revelation comes from God telling Moses to take your shoes off. Loose your shoes from your feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. He was referring not to the two by four piece of real estate. He was speaking about a spiritual state, and he calls Moses from that place to put off his shoes from his feet. Moses arrived to that place dealing with the dust of the earth, the issues of life, the walking in this world, and what God was saying to him is that your feet are dirty. It's the same revelation in the New Testament that Jesus shares with the disciples, where he comes to them and washes their feet. He says, listen, you've been in the world and if you bring the world into the presence of God, you'll be unsuccessful in your prayer life. I have been unsuccessful in prayer when I come to God in a worldly manner. I've been unsuccessful in my relationship with God. Even my requests seem to be polluted with things of this life. And God says, I got to get you to a place where you're loosed from the things of this life. Because we don't know what to ask for if all we're doing is operating and traveling in the issues of this life. And Moses is being told by God that he should loose his shoes. He's being stripped of his rights, the removal of his shoes. This is what it 
was meant to be. Um, this is a symbol in the Old Testament, stripped of reputation, stripped of position, stripped of ego, stripped of advancement. God is going to reveal himself as the I am, but he needed to be able to get Moses to be stripped of something, and he tells him to be stripped of your shoes. And I think it's valuable for me and you to recognize that when we enter into the presence of the Lord, we kind of need to be stripped of the ABCs that follow our business card. Are you, are you good today? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with challenging you to uh, leave the estate of your current progression, come into the presence of God. If he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, take off your crown. If he is the Lord of lords, remove your ring. If he is the Almighty, then strip before him so that you can come to him only with your frail human nature for him to transform you from the inside out. Yeah. Now, I know this isn't popular preaching. This was, this was elementary preaching. We sung some songs from the 90s. I've asked uh, uh, for Steph to kind of dig back into the songs that were real purified in those days. You could tell how old Pastor Tom is. He said it was his favorite song. Many of you probably never even heard it. No, it's not something fresh from Elevation. It's not out of Maverick. Those people weren't even born when that song was written. Bless the good Lord. Um, Stripped of reputation here. Moses moved among the wealthy and influential. He was probably in his day the best known man of his time. Probably best known for his rise to power. He was best known as the prince of Egypt. And since he was the prince of Egypt, when he fell from grace, oh my God, he became infamous. Is that Moses, the man who killed an Egyptian soldier? To identify with the Jews? Is that the man, the prince of Egypt? That was destined to be on the throne of Pharaoh? God is telling him that we need to remove all of that. God had to remove his popularity, his esteem. He had to remove everything from him and strip him of that. He had to remove the fig leaves and the sandals in order for him to see uh, Moses reach his potential. This is echoed in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 28, when it comes to Jesus, they, they, they stripped him and put upon him a scarlet robe. There's something there to be mentioned here that in the stripping of Jesus, symbol of everything being stripped from him, God is getting into a place to maximize what he is supposed to do in his life. As hard as the cross is, Jesus knew that was his mission. For him, the mission was to go to the cross. John the Baptist says in John chapter 3, verse 28, he must increase, but I must decrease. Increase happens when I decrease. When my cup is poured out, he fills my cup. He can't fill a full cup until I first pour it out. Philippians 2, 5 to 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is echoed in so many different places. Number two, Exodus chapter four, verses two to four. And the Lord said unto him, what is in your hand, Moses? So first, Moses is stripped at the burning bush of his shoes. He takes off his shoes. He's on holy ground, stripped of his nature, stripped of his power, stripped of his position. He now enters into that place where he can hear from God and God gives him a second revelation or a second instruction. He says, what is in your hand? He was a shepherd and he's now older in life. We think he's probably in his upper 60s to 70s at this stage of life. It had been common in those days uh, for every shepherd to have a rod in their hand. This wasn't like nowadays a cane in his hand, a rod that would stand probably a little taller than him. It worked in numerous means. It held him up. 
But as a shepherd, if he needed to defend the sheep against the wild animal, he could outstretch the rod in his hand and keep the animal away from the sheep. And so God looks at him and says, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. He said, cast it to the ground. And he cast it to the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. And he went and put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Verse 4 is kind of crazy because you just don't grab a snake by the tail. So anyone that deals with snakes, and while I haven't dealt with physical snakes, I have dealt with people snakes. Amen? Yeah, Leviathan, I mean snake, boas. And here's what I've learned, never take them by the tail. If you want to deal with a snake, deal with the head. Does that make sense? Look him in the eye. Praise God. Verse 4 is like crazy. Grab the snake by the tail. No. You're going to grab that snake by the tail? You grab that snake by the tail. It's the worst position. Of, it's a snake. It's going to turn around and bite me. The rod or the staff, if you're taking notes, write this down. The rod or the staff was his support. It was an aid for him to walk. It was that which he leaned on when he got weary. It was a defense in the time of danger. It assisted him in getting up the Rocky Mountains. It was a necessary rod, not just a cane for walking. It had multiple applications, and God is going after it. The psalmist in Psalm 23, verse 4 said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thy are with me thy rod and thy staff comfort me. That rod in the Old Testament is symbolic now of the presence of God. But in the day of Moses, so it's easy for David to say, because he's got the first five books of the Bible. He's read this story before. Not Moses. Moses' rod, I don't know about you, but if I see a burning bush and I don't know what's going on, I'm hanging on to my rod. That rod is a rod of protection. Does that make sense? I'm going to keep you at rod's distance from me. Here's what the Lord is going to teach Moses. Moses continue. Moses must now transition his support. He must now lean on God when he is weary. God must now be his defense. Does that make sense? If he's going to be successful, here's what God is saying. The road in front of you, the road of life is going to be dangerous. It is going to be wary. It is going to be difficult. You're going to need someone to lean on. You're going to need a tool to defend yourself. And I'm telling you that that rod needs to be sanctified. That rod, that rod needs to be my rod. So throw it on the ground. Here's what God says. Just as that natural rod is that for you, I am now your rod. And I love this. If you're taking notes, write this down. When you ca he told him to cast the rod to the ground. What did it turn into? Turn into a serpent. What did Moses do? He fled from the serpent. So there a cobra appears and he runs from the serpent. Here's what God says to Moses. In almost a dual definition revelation, he says, I'm going to be your rod, but if you cast me aside, you're going to get bit by serpents. When you're weary, if you cast me aside, you're going to see devastation. When you're in trouble and I'm not your defense, you will not be successful. If you cast away your confidence and your faith in Jehovah and you desire to stand alone, you'll find yourself before the serpent, that old devil. Here's what he's saying. I am your defense, but if you cast me away, the enemy's going to show up like a flood. He's trying to get Moses to understand that the enemy is after his soul because he has a mission. 
Because he chose him as a deliverer, the enemy knows that. When you gave your life to the Lord, the enemy knew it. People tell me sometimes they're, they're Christians. They say, we don't believe, believe in spiritual warfare. <laughs> yeah, okay. We just want to live peaceably with all men. Well, that don't work with demons. The more you get committed to Jesus, the more you attach yourself to God's anointing and God's mission in your life, the more the enemy wants to take you out. Thank you. There's like four people clapping. I really appreciate that. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? You lean on the rod of God. You lean on the rod of God. I had to check myself this week because I felt like I was leaning on a natural rod. I felt like I was leaning on my own strength. I felt like I was relying on my own strength. I was weary. I was, I was brokenhearted, emotionally depleted. I still am. And I've had to run back to the burning bush and God has said to me, he said to me, you got the wrong rod in your hand. You're trying to make sense of something that won't make sense in the natural. Lean on me. Trust me in this. God gives Moses and us a practical lesson. The secret of overcoming Satan is simply, simply depending on God. Simply that. Grabbing the rod of God and depending on it. And when the enemy buffets you, just lean on the rod. It's the rod that's going to keep you safe. It's the rod that's going to defend you. This rod, Moses will use. This is the most powerful rod in ever history of all the Bible. It is the rod that he uses to hit the rock and water comes out. It's the rod that will smack the ground and the waters will open up. This rod represents the power of God. But that rod needed to be purified. And God says to him, what's in your hand? A rod, throw it to the ground. Throw it to the ground. God is trying to get him to understand something important here. Not only that, but in the hand of Moses, being the first rod mentioned in the Bible, which theologically we know that the law of first mention has a significant kind of revelation within it. It's a messianic verse. It's a picture of Christ, a messianic prophecy that the rod is the picture of Christ who for our sake was cast down to the ground to become sin and risen again to the right hand of the Father. In John chapter 3, verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In Galatians 3, 13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us as it is written, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. Um, Psalm 110, you don't need to turn to it, verse 2, the Lord shall send the rod of his strength out of Zion to rule in the midst of his enemies. The rod. What are you leaning on this morning? Rather than me ask what you're going through, because I don't know what you're going through. There are too many of you here for me to understand what you're going through. And I don't have some mystical answer to everything that you're going through and every struggle you're going through. But this one thing I do know is the rod is sufficient for me and sufficient for you. If I can get you to the burning bush, if I can get you to the place of isolation, if I could give you any encouragement on the backside of the mountain, in the midst of your weeping, your tears, your struggle, your prison, your difficulty, whatever mountain's in front of you, if I could give you any counsel, is God's at work. God's at work. In the midst of the fire, God's at work. And lean on the rod that God gives you. Lean on the rod. Third revelation out of this verse of Scripture how many have read this, these stories before? Kind of look through this and tear this apart. Verse 6 says, And the Lord said furthermore unto Moses, Put now thy hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous as snow. 
That's what God says. Moses draped, draped with a shawl over him. He says, now put your hand in your bosom. He puts his hand in his bosom. He pulls out his hand and it is full of leprosy, white as snow. What symbolism is in this? You say you want to get the holy ground? You want to be Moses right now? You want to be grabbing a serpent by the tail? No, we just want to see the burning bush. We don't want to go to Pharaoh. We don't want to be a deliverer. We don't want to deal with the armies of the enemy behind us and the Red Sea before us. We just want a burning bush. Many of us in Christianity in the 21st century, we want an experience with God with no end in mind. Meaning the experience isn't tied to any great call that God has for us. It's just an experience. And we've been so addicted to an experience that the church has created counterfeit experiences that tell us that we're in the presence of God when we may be in the presence of emotion which never kind of becomes purposeful to God's destiny. I was at worship service today and I cried. Great. It's awesome. You cried. Did it lead you to something, to God's greater purpose in life? Or is it just an experience for being an experience? Sometimes I think just the experience is the goal of most Christians. In all church growth books, it's all about creating an experience for people. An experience in the foyer, an experience in the sanctuary, an experience in the sea, an experience in worship. The preacher must preach something that's an experience. I'm here to tell you hogwash. The burning bush is tied to his great mission. Otherwise, Moses, if you're not going to go to Pharaoh, then I'll use someone else. Stay on the backside of the mountain. I'm going to walk with you because there's a greater purpose for me and you to accomplish something great. Jesus says to the disciples, drop your nets and I will make you fishers of men. If you don't want to fish for men, keep fishing for fish. Greater purpose. Greater purpose. This message is tied to some greater purpose in your life. That greater purpose demands greater presence. Purpose and presence are tied together. Lord, I need more of your presence because I'm trying to fulfill a greater purpose. And the greater purpose attracts greater difficulty and greater adversity for new levels, bring new devils. And in the midst of that greater pressure, that greater pressure demands that I have greater presence. Does that make sense? Greater presence. God, I need greater presence to deal with the things that I'm dealing with. Here's what Moses needed a revelation of. Please hear this. Moses needed a revelation because he did not know that there was leprosy in his own bosom. He did not know that there was leprosy in his own bosom. He was terrified by what was in his heart. He was terrified by what was in his heart. In the original language, the bosom uh, word there in the Hebrew speaks of heart. Put your hand in your bosom to where your heart is. So he would have taken his right hand, the hand of God's authority, which would have been held on the rod. He would have put it into his bosom. And when he took it out, it would have been full of leprosy. Leprosy was an incurable ailment in the days of Moses. And what terror he would have experienced when he pulled out his hand and his hand was filled with what was called the depravity of the flesh. The boils of the flesh, the whiteness of the leprosy, the disease of leprosy. And it came from his own bosom. How can Moses stretch forth a leprous hand to bring about deliverance. Impossible. 
Was God indulging in a little magic? No. Here's what God was saying. He was saying is that when self is in control, you'll hurt others. When you operate which that which is in your own bosom, it will be leprosy. It will be leprous. Leprosy is a type of sin. What he was saying is, Moses, I know you're good hearted, but let me just tell you something about your own nature. In your nature, in your sin nature, there is leprosy. And I need to make sure that when you stretch out your hand, and when you begin to do great acts of deliverance in my name, when I give you the type of authority that you can take up serpents, when I give you the type of anointing that you can leave Israel out of, out of bondage, when I send you before Pharaoh, I don't want you relying on your own nature. I want you to realize that in your nature is leprosy. Does this make sense? Some of us, we get to the place, especially when we get more, um, how do I say this the right way? When, when we are saved a little longer, can I just talk to you about salvation for a second? So when we, when we get saved a little longer and we've been saved longer than 10 minutes, through your relationship with Jesus, you begin to have transformation. If you've been having a relationship with the Lord and you are what we consider to be an intimate believer, then you will acquire your marriage between you and the Holy Spirit will begin to produce a level of righteousness, right standing, right thinking. Does that, does that make sense? You should be. If not, then, then you, shouldn't be, you should not be one who gave your life to the Lord and nothing changed. You should be thinking right, talking right. There should be some personal transformation. Here's what God is saying. Is that righteousness, which is the product of you and the Holy Spirit, still cannot save you on the day of judgment. Only the righteousness that flows from Jesus. And as righteous and popular you get, don't think your heart's still not full of leprosy. As popular as the... Hollywood pastor gets as popular as the popular pastor gets with fame, let them be reminded. You're still full of leprosy, boy. Brother, you still got leprosy on the inside. When preachers are being carted in with bodyguards, They need to be reminded. Here's what God is saying. I'm going to bring you before Pharaoh, but I want you to remember that in your bosom is still leprosy. You have the potential to do great, but what lies in you is still sin. And you need to guard yourself against that leprosy. Does that make sense? Guard yourself against that leprosy. When self is in control, you end up hurting and you bring reproach on the work of the Lord. When you attempt to do my work in spectacular fleshy ways, you minister death and not life. I cannot use the old nature from Egypt, God is saying. It cannot be transformed. It will always be leprosy. There must be a new man, one caught up in the glory and the power of the I am. Moses was commanded in verse 7, put his leprous hand back into his bosom. And the Lord said, put now thy hand back in your bosom again. And he put his hand in his bosom again, and he plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it turned again as his other flesh. Put your hand in your bosom and pull it out again. This second pulling out, represents ministry. The extended hand for the believer is the hand of ministry. And here's what God is saying. By, by it, the extended hand, seas will open, fires will fall, miracles will be performed. By the hand of Moses, there will be 10 judgments that are going to fall on Egypt. 
from leprosy to lies to boils. And here's what he's saying. I need to ensure that when you stretch forth your hand, it is being stretched forth with my nature, not your nature. That ministry, ministry is going to be done out of a bosom that is filled with the Holy Spirit, not a bosom filled with leprosy. Leprosy is sin. Hidden, unexposed, unforsaken sin. No good thing in us. Can I give you a newsflash? We all have leprosy, including myself. Would you think, because I'm up here, one of the greatest things a minister should understand, no matter the size of a church. See, sometimes we get, we get lulled to sleep by external markers that normally would say you're successful. Well, that person has to be successful because look how many people follow them. Well, if that was a criteria to define whether God is in it, then I mean, you can just, you could just look at cults and say, well, that, they must be of God too. Some of the fastest growing organizations today are not Christian, Christian based. Here's what the, track the apostle Paul. He is, in my opinion, by the quantity of contribution to the New Testament. We know of at least 11 epistles penned by him and possibly two more. You could say by far, he's the chiefest of apostles, but what does he call himself? He keeps reminding you, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Oh, wretched man that I am. His bosom, every time he reaches into his bosom and pulls it out, he sees leprosy. He puts his hand in his bosom, he sees that he held the cloak to, to stone Stephen. He sees in him the fact that he is frail, that he is carnal, that he is sinful, and that's why God keeps using him. Because he recognizes that there's leprosy there. He says, rather than glory in all the outward things that I've accomplished, he could easily just tell you, man, I planted 15 churches. I got campuses all over the world. I wrote letters. I got magazines named after me. Demons know who I am. The dead were raised. No, he didn't say any of that. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. I was blind, now I see I'm the least of the apostles, not the most of them. He continues to try to stay humble. He continues to see the potential of wickedness in the midst of his growth. I know it's not popular, but you know what? It'll save you in a time of need. It'll save you in the time of need. And so, and so Moses is getting a second sanctifying touch. Here's the greatness of the verse. He puts his hand into his bosom. He pulls it out of his leper, and the Lord doesn't leave him in that condition. He says, put it back in again and take it out. And it was healed. Here's what God says. Make sure your bosom is always pure. Make sure your heart is always right. Moses, if I'm going to use you for greatness, purify your heart. Now, Bad news for Moses is we now know what's going on with Moses. Good news for you, no one will probably know the leprosy you have in your heart, which is why God takes you to the backside of the mountain. Does that make sense? God will drag you to the place of isolation. God will bring you to the place that you stand before him in the midst of the the burning bush, and that is the secret place. That is the holy place. It's so holy, no one else could get on it. Wouldn't be holy if someone else stepped on it. Does that, does that make sense? Holy ground isn't a place that me and my wife go to together. No, because her leprosy and my leprosy is different. Her deliverance and my deliverance is different. Her anointing and my anointing is different. Yes, we can pray together. Yes, we can sup together. But God needs to get me in an isolated place in front of a burning bush to minister to me. It wasn't a place for him and Jethro. No, there's no room there. There's no room for him and your pastor. I can't go to your holy ground with you. I know you want to drag me with you. I don't want to go. You deal with your own bosom yourself. 
I'll stay down at the bottom. I'll go. Shoo. Shoo. Walk you up the mountain yourself. But I'm miserable. Yes, you are. I'm depressed. Go. Go. May the Lord be with you. Does that, does that, does that make sense? I know you keep calling people. You're on the calling. I need prayer. I need a prophet. You need a burning bush. You need Jesus. That's what you need. You don't need tell someone telling you it's going to be all right. It's not. Not until you put your hand in your bosom. It's only going to be all right till you put your hand in your bosom, you pull it out, you see how nasty it is, and then God says, I'll address it. I'll address it. You put it back in, you take it out, and he addressed it. Is that? But when God heals that, you don't forget that. Does that you don't forget that. I'm sure every time Moses was getting dressed, he put his cloak on, tucked in his, he must have been like, oh boy. I don't know about you, but every day I would look at that hand. Just making sure, what's that spot right there? Honey, look, get a magnifying glass. Right? Pastor Sam, you'd be going nuts, right? <laughs> Pastor Sam's got this thing where it's just like, he just starts thinking of sickness. He's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Every day I'd be checking it. Look, I see a little white speck here. What is that? It's cotton from your shirt. <laughs> it's meant for you to never forget. It's meant for you to be able to have it as a marker in your life, a milestone in your life. The burning bush experience is designed to help Moses get through his future destiny. His future destiny. You still good? Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? The answer is no, only God. Keep that heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4, 23. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are pure at heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, but an evil man out of his evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Talks about that which proceeds out of the mouth comes from the heart. There are, there are some mile markers and signs to tell you the condition of your heart. Check your speech. Check how you talk. Check how you react. Those are, those are things to tell you whether there is leprosy in the heart. Out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murder, murders and adulteries and fornication and thefts and false witness and blasphemy. This is all in here. The psalmist writes and says in Psalm 51, verse 10, create in me another old song. <laughs> create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Well, you can't create a clean heart unless you know what's in the heart. You don't know until God reveals the leprosy. And he's going to do it in an isolated area. He's going to do it when he gets you alone. Out of his grace and mercy, he wants to equip you for greatness. Very few people throughout the Bible have found the place Moses has found. This isn't a place for the masses. I tend to think very few people have been willing to strip themselves of their shoes, been willing to make sure that they throw down and cast to the ground their own strength, their own rods to grab the rod of God, where they hang on things that God is going to be the rock, he's going to be the rod. Very few have had a real picture and understanding of the leprosy in the old nature. When you can get to that place, God can do something great with you. And let me say that again. God can do something great with you. The greatest of greatness in the story of Moses is this was before he ever did any ministry. God dealt with this up front. He said, I want to use you for ministry, but I don't think I can unless I bring, give you an experience with me. I need you to connect with me at such a level that you never forget me. Every time he held that rod, I'd be concerned. I would not sleep with that rod at night. Not knowing whether I would keep the rod in the corner with a mouse around it. Because if it ever turned into a snake, I'd rather have it go after the mouse first. 
right? You, you, you start looking at that rod, you're like, eh, think about bite me. And shouldn't that be the same thing when you're, can I just separate a couple things here? When you move from spectator to participator, when you begin to be in ministry, if you're in any level of ministry, God now shifts in your life. He's concerned about you, absolutely. He wants to equip you, absolutely. He wants to transform you, absolutely. But he doesn't want the sheep that you lead to be negatively affected. This is why at the resurrection, he says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, of course I love you. He says, yeah, feed my sheep. Because the condition of you feeding the sheep now is gonna be the measure of love you have for me. This isn't just about me and you, Peter, any longer. This is about you, me, and my bride. You mess with my bride, you mess with me. You mess with my church, you mess with me. You mess with the sheep, you mess with me. If you love me, love them. Because you can't love me and abuse them. Does this make sense? I know I segued into a little leadership there, but since I'm worn out, emotionally drained, I'll just chalk that up to the Lord. But maybe I had a dose of the anointing to say to you, a healthy warning that as Moses is being prepared for ministry, God is keeping his power in check, his anointing in check. Because he needs Israel to have a deliverer that is going to be in a right spirit. I didn't deal now. I'm going to stop here because I didn't. I, didn't, I don't want to segue into the second interaction between Moses and God. I wanted to deal with the holy ground. We kind of move from holy ground now to mission discourse, destiny discourse. We begin to discuss Moses' calling that he's going to be sent to Pharaoh, Moses' unwillingness to go to Pharaoh, and an exchange between him and God in order for him to become the deliverer. But up to this point, we're dealing with holy ground. 21st century, day we live in, we are desperate to find a place of holy ground and it's not getting on a flight. It's not traveling anywhere. It's you getting to a place where God's presence shows up. And when God's presence shows up, he makes it holy. Many times we don't even think it's holy until he shows up. When he shows up, he just creates a circle with you in it. That's the place God would like to get me and you. It's the place of long-term sustainability. It's a place that God's been wooing me to again as I am drained and looking for answers. God is saying, your answers are going to be found on holy ground. Just stand still, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. It's God saying to me, son, just stand still, just stand still. Let me come and sanctify the ground. Let me purge you of your emotions and your questions and your doubt and your faithlessness and hopelessness. Let me minister to your heart. Put your hand in your bosom, son. What's in it? Leprosy. Let me heal you. Let me heal your heart. What's in there? What type of leprosy? Discouragement. What type of leprosy? Oh, leprosy is not just sin. Sin shows up. Sin's just kind of a category. And then in it is all the things it brings. Doubt, faithlessness, anger, suspicion. How could you let this happen? To the parable of the man with the talent. He said, I knew you were a hard God. His perspective changed with God. It's Adam now because there's sin. He's running from the presence of God. Sometimes we put our hands into our bosom. And we take it out. We take out his doubt. It's an undercurrent that we could be going to church, doing our ministry, attending church as members, but we really have an undercurrent with God. We don't trust him any longer. Had an experience in church, we don't trust the church. First of all, you should have never trusted the church. You should always trust the God. You always put your trust in God. Can I, can I just talk to you maturity? We're all human. Different stages of elevation, 
different stage of evolution when it comes to our relationship, different stages of maturity. While earth is here and while the church is in earth, it will at times be a place of discouragement and disappointment. But God, God will never be that. Is that, my trust is in the Lord. My trust is in the King of Kings, the Shepherd of Shepherds. Is this all making sense? Are you good? I don't know where you're at, but I would say, uh, Sam says I keep taking my glass. I guess I've, I've gotten a pet peeve of a habit here, which has nothing to do with this message. Let me close at least with this call. If you're desiring a burning bush experience, there's a call on your life. If you would like to get to the next level of your Christianity, if you would like to get to the next place of your maturity, the Bible talks about babes in Christ, talks about mature believers in Christ, and you would like to progress to the next stage. I think it always is predicated by an experience with the Lord. And you are open for God to show up and to surround you and to create a place with you, isolated from everyone else, called holy ground. If that's you, just raise your hand this morning and say, preacher, that's me. I would like to have a holy ground experience. Stand with me then if you've raised your hand 